are Locked On Seahawks, your daily Seattle Seahawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings, 12s and Saints fans. It's crossover Thursday. We've got a big-time primetime matchup coming up on Monday Night Football. The Seahawks returning to Lumen Field to host the Saints. I'm Corbin Smith for Locked On Seahawks. Joining me for the show, the great Ross Jackson of Locked On Saints. Before we talk football, got to congratulate Ross. He spent his bye week doing uh, some pretty exciting <laughs> things getting married congratulations <laughs> i appreciate you man i'm very grateful uh you know beautiful bride beautiful ceremony everything was great great to have the family and friends out so uh but you know i'm ready to be back on this grind so uh, i appreciate that man thank you yeah speaking of the grind uh, th these are two teams that have a little bit of history they've played a few times in the playoffs and i know saints fans don't like hearing about those matchups but the Saints have had the upper hand the last couple times these two teams have played, winning both in Seattle and in New Orleans. And so they get to face off for the first time in two years. It's just so weird because you guys have a different quarterback in Jameis Winston, but it's like we haven't faced Drew Brees since 2016. Anyway, <laughs> right. so Teddy Bridgewater was under center last time these two teams met. Coming out of the bye, the, the Saints got several players coming off IR that are expected to be returning, but – you and I were talking about it before the show. The biggest name they were hoping to maybe get back for this game isn't quite ready to return. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Before I dive into it, first of all, whether you're listening on Locked on Saints or Locked on Seahawks, thanks so much for making us your first listen of the day. We appreciate you very much for uh, taking the time. Available free on all platforms and on YouTube as well. Yes, for the New Orleans Saints, uh, when it comes down to Michael Thomas, it was a little bit of a disappointment, but it also makes a ton of sense. Yes. He, you know, is coming off of the physically unable to perform list. And so he's eligible to return. But the reality is that this guy hasn't practiced since January, right? It's been a long time. And even during that time, he was injured. He was hurt while practicing. So, you know, it, it seems very likely that he's going to take another couple of weeks. Plus, he'll probably take a little bit of that 21-day practice window that'll end up being activated once he's designated to return. So no Michael Thomas in this one, though the New Orleans Saints hope to get him back over the next couple of weeks. And then hopefully potentially see some returns with some other pieces as well on the offense and defense. But before I dive into those, I'm curious. I mean, you know, it's not only the new the Seattle Seahawks who you know aren't going to be facing, or, or let me say it this way, actually, it's not only New Orleans Saints that are going to have a different quarterback, right? Obviously, the Seattle Seahawks are going to be dealing with a different quarterback situation here with Russell Wilson out for the next couple of weeks. Geno Smith got the start last week against the Pittsburgh Steelers, ended up only being a three point loss there and a really nice sort of. Uh, closing of the gap late in the game. How are you feeling about Geno Smith going into this Monday night matchup against the New Orleans Saints? About the same as I did going into last week. I can see why the Seahawks are confident in him. Now, he is not Russell Wilson. Everybody knows that. But there's a reason he was a second-round pick coming out of West Virginia. I mean, he's got the physical tools. He's got an NFL arm. He made a throw the other day. I don't know if Russell Wilson could have made this throw. It was just a dime. That was a and you just don't throw. see Russell make throws like that in between the hashes. He's an outstanding thrower outside the numbers, obviously. He's got that advantage. But I do think that might be one area that Geno Smith might be a little bit better. And maybe it's because he's taller. I don't know. But sure. his touch on that pass was outstanding. That was a true NFL throw. But Geno Smith can run the same playbook. You can do the same stuff as far as mixing in quarterback runs doing read options, mm -hmm. getting him outside of the pocket. He can throw the ball downfield. Not quite as proficient of a deep ball thrower, obviously, but you could throw the ball downfield. He has his limitations. Not a player that necessarily is going to be uh, making the best decisions all the time. That's something that was concerning in New York. I do think he's improved that area of his game since Seattle got him a few years ago. The biggest question mark is going to be, can you protect him, especially against the Saints pass rush that's going to get Marcus Davenport back potentially? And that leads me to ask you about the Saints defense because it, normally when we're talking a game with the Saints, it's how many points can we limit them to? Because typically <laughs> under Sean Payton, they've been back and forth offense, high octane team. But this is the number two ranked scoring defense in the entire NFL. It feels like the script has been flipped. And this is just a totally different team than what Sean Payton has had in the past. And they're still finding ways to win games. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they look, and we've seen this change start over the past couple of years. I mean, we've seen it progress over time. 2017, 
This team was ranked 17th in the NFL. They moved up to 14th, 11th after that. Then they were top five in 2020. And right now they're still operating like a top five unit or a top 10 unit, depending upon which metric you're looking at. And so I think that the Saints are very much a defense that you know, has the ability to win some games here and uh, maybe change the tide of, of a few matchups. And I think the Saints defense will need to do that. Look, let's not forget here that even when you're talking about, even though you're talking about a Russell Wilson-less Seattle Seahawks team, it's hard to play Seattle on the road in prime time with that defense that has struggled so far to open up the season, but you saw some really good things come out of it in the second half of that win, or excuse me, that loss against the Pittsburgh Steelers. Have they reached their turning point, this Seattle defense? And so if that is the case, you have to make sure that your defense is able to limit the amount of points that are being scored over on the other side. And that's going to be tough to do with some very talented receivers on that Seattle Seahawks roster, despite who the quarterback is. Uh, potentially getting players like Quan Alexander and Marcus Davenport back this week would be huge. There are a couple of players on the offensive side that could potentially return this week as well. Trey Quan Smith was also designated to return off of injured reserve. Eric McCoy, the starting center as well as Teron Armstead starting left tackle, both of their timelines seem to suggest that after the bye week within those first couple of weeks that they could potentially make it back as well. So you're seeing both this offense and this defense get healthier, but so far the defense has been the story. The Seattle Seahawks defense also making news so far this season, maybe not uh, looking at it on the, uh, you know, it's kind of the opposite side of the spectrum, but I do think you saw some pretty good things out of them in the second half of that Steelers game. Do you feel like they might have turned the tide a little bit as they uh, stretch over to this Monday night matchup? Well, Pete Carroll was trying to convince me of that <laughs> on Monday. He's, he's like, this was a big stepping stone for us. And I can see to an extent, especially when I went back and watched the film, yeah. they kind of got away from the bear fronts that they've been running the first five mm -hmm. games, kind of went back to their bread and butter, running more 4-3, reduced oversets, which allowed them to get Jamal Adams along the line of scrimmage more often, and he was more disruptive. He did still take what should have been an interception off the face mask, so the coverage yeah. questions are going to continue for him, but he had a much better game than what he's been doing recently because it felt like they were using him a little bit better as far as his skill set is concerned, and the fact that they were able to hold the Steelers to just three field goals in the second half in overtime is assuring at the same time, I don't feel like this is like last year when their defense turned the corner at the, the middle of the season when they got Carlos Dunlap, they had a few other players like Adams come back from injury, and then everything just turned around. That was against the Rams. Even with Jared Goff, still had a lot of weapons, and they held yeah. them to six points in the second half. Still lost the game, but they kept the team in the game and played much better in the second half. But this is Steelers' offense that was ranked 27th overall going into this game. They've got a quarterback in Ben Roethlisberger that can still get the job done to an extent, but he's cooked in a lot of ways. Yeah. And they don't have a lot of weapons anymore. Juju Smith-Schuster wasn't available in that game. So I, I don't know. I'm hesitant to say they've turned the corner. Now, if they can come out against the Saints and they can have another game where they give up 20, less, 20 or less points and they're able to limit yardage, the run defense is better than – yeah, maybe we can pull a John Wick and say, I think I'm back. But <laughs> for right now, I, I am hesitant to do that because I just don't know that I can trust this defense. They've got talent. They've not been able to put it together. We're going to start talking matchups here coming up in the second quarter. But before we get to that, uh, let's uh, talk about Rock Auto. This episode is brought your way by Rock Auto with the ever-increasing numbers of makes and models. It's now impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts you need. Why endure often pointless or seemingly intimidating questioning and wait while the person behind the, count, behind the counter orders the parts on their computer, choosing only the brand their warehouse happens to carry? You have computers with access to rockauto.com at home and in your pocket. Why choose to spend 30, 50, or even 100% more for the same parts from a chain store or a car dealership? Rock Auto prices are reliably low for every customer. They have everything you could need, whether it's brake parts, tail lamps, motor oil. They even had a steering wheel cover for my new Dodge Charger. Go explore their easy-to-use website today to find the solution to your auto parts needs. Go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck right locked on in there. How did you hear about us, box? So they know we sent you amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. rockauto.com. All right, let's talk some matchups here, Ross. We've got the Seahawks and the Saints Monday night football coming up in week seven. Saints in a much better spot right now, three and two coming out of a bye. The Seahawks, they're limping into this game 
with a two and four record. No Russell Wilson, no Chris Carson, but they're coming back to Lumen Field. They're hoping to finally win a game at home. They're 0 and 2 at home. Their home field mystique seems like it's disappeared a little bit. Let's talk some matchups here that are a bit concerning. We talked about the Saints on defense, how well they've played this year. I will say this, the opponents they've played have not exactly been offensive juggernauts. And even without Russell Wilson, Seattle's got plenty of weapons on that side of the football. What are you most concerned about for this Saints defense going into this Monday night game? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think you you mentioned it there. I mean, look, with Russell Wilson on injured reserve, with Chris Carson on injured reserve, who's a running back that, by the way, I think needs a lot more respect in the NFL and amongst NFL fans they talk about great running backs in the NFL. Uh, but when it comes down to it, these wide receivers, I mean, look, Marshall Lattimore's had a fantastic season to open up the year, and he's shown up against some of the top competition, right? Terry McLaurin, he had a fantastic game against him and the Washington football team last week or the week before last, before the bye week. You look at his opening game up against the Green Bay Packers. That was a huge matchup that he had there with Devontae Adams, and he performed extremely well there. So I think, you know, Marshall Lattimore's done a good job rising to the occasion, and I would expect him to do that again here against DK Metcalf, Tyler Lockett, whoever it is that he ends up locked in on. And I think that's going to be the interesting thing to watch is, is he going to follow and shadow a receiver? Are they going to play sides? Are they going to move around? We'll see exactly how it is that the Saints defense decides to handle that because then whoever Marshall Lattimore is not on, You've either got rookie Paulson Adebo, who has had an impressive start to his career so far. Don't get me wrong. Two interceptions already on the season, both of them in the red zone. But again, these are very talented wideouts that he's got to go up against and a, and a talented offense that he's got to go up against. So it'll either be him or it'll be Bradley Roby, who the Saints haven't really gotten a ton of playing time for since trading a third round pick for him earlier on in the season before the uh, first game of the year. So will we see more Bradley Roby? Will it be Paulson Adebo? In any case, the secondary is going to be tested with some talented receivers. So that's where I'll start off on my concerning parts when I look at the Saints defense versus the Seattle offense. Let's flip the script a little bit, talk about the Seattle defense up against the New Orleans Saints offense. Where are your concerning matchups there? It's got to start with Alvin Kamara. It starts and ends with him. You think about what he did the last time these two teams met back in 2019. I've said this a couple times on shows earlier this week, so the 12s that are listening are going to be like, okay, stop making this comparison, but <laughs> I can't help it. I feel like if you go into the Saints locker room before a game, they're getting butter spray, or I can't believe it's not butter. Maybe they're going healthier, and they're just spraying it all over his uniform, and somehow oh, yeah. it's clear because <laughs> every time the Seahawks tried to tackle him in that game, he just kept slithering through them and then getting big yardage, scored a couple of touchdowns, one on the ground and one through the air. And I just look at the issues the Seahawks have had stopping running backs this year. Now, they did well against Najee Harris the other day. Held him in check. That was the first time I can say that this year. They held Derrick yeah. Henry down for a half, and then King Henry decided, I've had enough of this. And second yeah. half, took <laughs> over the game. You don't have to tackle him that many times. He's going to start winning some of those runs. But right. they just have had their issues with running backs running the ball and out of the backfield as receivers. Bobby Wagner's still a very good player, but he still ha he has some issues occasionally in coverage, especially against running backs. Jordan Brooks has been very hit and miss in that area. Their Sam linebacker spot, they've been playing players like Benson Mayoa there, who's really a defensive end by trade. He gave up a touchdown to Harris as a receiver the other day. So there are concerns there, and the Seahawks have missed quite a few tackles this year too. So you can't go after Camara with arm tackles. You better be wrapping up and you better get some teammates coming to help bring him down or otherwise For sure. that deceptive speed that he brings to the table, the quickness, the elusiveness, he is going to torch you. And so quite frankly, I'm terrified by the, especially because I look at his numbers, 3.9 yards per carry. I'm like, he is due, which really <laughs> worries me going into this game. Uh, let's talk Saints when they are on offense. I, I know it might be weird thinking about what concerns you when you look at Seattle's defense, considering how poor they played, but they do have a lot of talent on that defense, which maybe is the most disappointing part about the way they've played this year. They do have a number of all pro players. What are you most worried about from a Saints offensive perspective going against this defense that has talent, but hasn't been able to put everything together yet? Yeah, so protection is a big part of it for me. Uh, listen, if, if, if with any quarterback, if you get pressure on that quarterback, they become more turnover prone. They become, you know, uh, they, they're not as good a passer. Now, Jameis Winston is number one in the NFL right now when it comes to touchdowns under pressure, but you can't expect it to be a sustainable model 
every single week, right? Like maybe somebody's really great under pressure. We saw it with, let's say, Joe Burrow in the greatest offense that we've seen in college football a couple of years ago. But even in some games, the pressure got to him and it's amount of the pressure got to him. And so I think that for the Saints, managing pressure coming from the second level or secondary pressure, even third level pressure from a guy like Jamal Adams, who I'm going to highlight specifically because of his ability to get back after the quarterback. They seem to be using him in the box a little bit more last week. I expect that they'll do that again this week up against uh, the Saints. Jamal Adams' coverage is one piece of the conversation, but his ability to get after the passer, guy had nine and a half sacks last year. I mean, his ability to be able to be disruptive and the Saints' inability to adjust to exotic pressure looks that are coming from second and third levels so far this season with the injuries that they've had along the offensive line. Now, some of this may end up being, you know, uh, kind of clarified a bit once we start seeing the injury report. But of course, injury reports come out later for a Monday night game. So we don't know just yet if Eric McCoy and Teron Armstead are practicing. That would be huge for the New Orleans Saints and sort of would help to alleviate my concern there. But if those guys are still injured, that's going to be something I'm going to be watching for big time is their ability to be able to you know, block some of these additional rushers and protect Jameis Winston. And that factors into Alvin Kamara's game as well, their ability to, to keep those guys at bay on the defensive side. Uh, for you, for the New Orleans Saints defense, and then when that Seattle offense is on the field, where's your biggest concern on that side? I actually, this is actually a tough one for me because I have several areas that really concern me. I could talk about pass protection. We don't know if Davenport's going to play yet. If he right. does, I'm terrified because Cameron sure. Jordan has also wreaked havoc. And Dwayne Brown's not playing well right now. He has not looked good the last mm. month. So your best offensive lineman is not playing well. Not a good omen. But I'm actually going to surprise some people here a little bit. I did talk about this on our Wednesday show on Lock of the Seahawks, but – I think for the Seahawks to win this game, you're going to get the team that's number two in the NFL in rushing defense, but you got to figure out a way to move the ball on the ground. And Pittsburgh had a top five rushing defense going into Sunday's game, and Seattle obliterated them in the second half. Alex Collins was running all over them. That line got to work. Can they do it against New Orleans? They've got maybe the most underrated, underappreciated middle linebacker in the game in Demario Davis. I have a ton of respect for the way that he plays the game. Um, a very good run defender, but I feel like if Seattle can get that downhill run game going a little bit, don't try to get too cute with your zone stuff. <laughs> Fucking right. Mix in some power, mix in some counter, mix in some trap, and really smash mouth football this Saints front seven. I think the Seahawks can have some success doing that, but if they're not able to establish that ground game I have a feeling that this game could be one of those that should be close that ends up getting ugly because you can't be one-dimensional when your backup quarterback is in and you're playing behind an offensive line that is not built to throw the ball 40 or 50 times a game. It's simply not built for that. They have built it to run the football, so they're going to want to carry over that momentum from the second half the other day. That's going to be easier said than done, though, because I have a ton of respect for that Saints front seven, their ability to stuff the run. So Seattle's got to be able to rise to the occasion. And so that's a concerning matchup. It's also one that I do think that the Seahawks can, can find some traction if they have the right game plan running the football and they play to their line strengths. That's a really, really fantastic point. And it's going to lead us into our keys to victory here in just a moment as we continue on with this Locked On crossover, Locked On Saints, Locked On Seahawks. What do each of these teams need to do for a victory? We'll talk about that. But first, I want to tell you about our friends over at betonline.ag, our exclusive online betting partners here at the Locked On Podcast Network. Uh, I want to talk a little bit. We're going to get into the line for this game here in a moment. But there's also a really interesting prop bet for this one. Over, under, four and a half touchdowns total in this game. You think it's going to be a shootout? You think it's going to be a defensive battle? There's an easy way for you to be able to take that knowledge that you have and potentially turn it into some ducats. So go and check them out over at betonline.ag. If you don't want to get in on the NFL, no problem. You could also check out the MLB. Uh, you still have a, you know, the rest of the World Series playoffs to take a look at. You've got the NBA, which just got underway as well. UFC, MMA, and even your favorite Vegas casino games over at betonline.ag as well. The best and easiest place to place your bets and have some fun. Get in on all of that action over at betonline.ag. And don't forget to use the promo code Locked On. All one word, L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N, to get a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. That's over at Bet Online, your online sportsbook experts. All right, let's get to our keys to the game here on our Crossover Thursday episode. Seahawks and Saints, Monday night football. 
Seahawks have lost two in a row. They're just trying to hang around in the playoff race right now. Third worst record in the NFC. So it looks like they're way out of the picture. Saints at three and two. They're right where they need to be contending in the division and for a playoff spot. So a lot on the line for both teams in prime time. Ross, looking from an offensive perspective for the Saints, what do they have to do going to Lumen Field? I know the Seahawks have not won a game there yet, but this is still a tough place to win football games. What do the Saints have to do on offense to get this victory and improve to 4-2? For sure. I'm going to start off with the, the the one on the offensive side here that is, is really kind of close to what you were just talking about and impacts a lot of different areas of where Seattle could be successful here. And it's that the Saints need to get off to a hot start. They haven't really been able to do that yet so far this season. Don't have a lot of opening drive touchdowns, but they're fantastic in the red zone so far this season. So if they can work their way down the field early and then be able to cash in and get a little bit of an early lead, then that helps to alleviate a couple of things. It starts to take the crowd out, although this is a very faithful fan base and a, you know, a, a passionate fan base, the 12. So they're going to show up no matter what. But you want to try to leverage as much as you can for as long as you can. So getting that early lead out to start would be helpful. And then it also sort of curves the idea for Seattle that they can get it going on the ground. If the Saints can get out to a multi-score lead or something like that, and I'm not talking about 17 points or anything like that. I'm trying to be realistic here. I'm talking about nine, 10 points, you know what I'm saying? But anything that allows them to sort of put Seattle in a situation where they might feel like they have to go to the air earlier than maybe they're comfortable doing so and keep them in the air in the second uh, in the second half, then hopefully that would be able to help the Saints there to be able to take advantage of that one dimensionality that you were mentioning would be important for the Seahawks to avoid. So that's going to be my key to victory for the Saints offense. What about you for Seattle's offense? Well, it's going to sound cliche, but when you consider what's happened in the last two games, Seattle had a chance to win against the Rams, even without Russell Wilson at the end of the game. Geno Smith gets picked. Then Sunday night, they got the ball back. Defense got to stop in overtime. First play, Geno Smith fumbles. And I felt bad for Geno Smith because he can't shoulder all the blame. He put them in position to win that game and unfortunately had that play happen. But they haven't been able to finish in large part because they've had untimely turnovers. So I'm going to say this right now. You can't turn over the football against this Saint defense. They're going to make some stops. It's a very good defense, but you can't give quick change of possessions with interceptions and fumbles. And a lot of that's going to fall on Geno Smith because he has made those two turnovers. Can he be clean? Can he protect the football, be the caretaker, be the game manager? If he can do that and they're able to run the ball a little bit, I, I like Seattle's chances of being in position the fourth quarter to win this game. And maybe this time they can finish it off. Now, let's talk Saints on defense when they're going against this Seattle offense without Russell Wilson, but still DK Metcalf. Alex yeah. Collins, a solid running back in the backfield. Tyler Lockett, Gerald Everett. Defensively, what's the key for the Saints to make life tough on the Seahawks on Monday night? Yeah, you need the Saints defensive stars to be stars in this one. That, that's simple for me. Marshawn Lattimore, Demario Davis, who we discussed earlier in this one. Uh, a revitalization of Cam Jordan, who has been getting a lot of pressure, even getting some hits on the quarterback, but has no sacks so far this season. And that might mean generating some turnovers. This is the team right now that is second in the NFL in total interceptions, despite the fact they've only played five games. And they're fifth in the NFL right now when it comes to turnover percentage in terms of what they're forcing over on the defensive side as well. 17.9% is their turnover percentage forced so far this season. So that would be a huge part. I mean, you look at where it is that Sean Payton wants to win. He wants to win in the trenches. And he wants to win the turnover battle. Those are the big things. So I think if the defense can get the ball back into the hands of the offense, whether it be via turnovers or some of those stops, then I think that's big. But those stars have to be able to show up and perform like stars in order for that to happen. What about that Seattle defense that's looking to get right here against New Orleans? Well, there's a lot of things they need to figure out how to get right. <laughs> but I'm sure our listeners at this point are going to know which direction I'm going here because I feel like Alvin Kamara is one of those few running backs. And, you know, I don't know that I prescribe the idea of running backs don't matter. I certainly don't believe that with Derrick Henry, who, if I had an MVP vote right now, would be my MVP in the league. Without easily, a doubt. Yeah. Uh, because of his ability to take over games. But Alvin Kamara can be that same kind of player. He does different things. He can be a really dynamic threat as a receiver. And again, I just look at Seattle's history against him in particular. The issues they've had defending running backs in general this year, I just really worry about how this defense is going to be able to handle him. And it seems like he's due for a big game. So we'll see what happens. But you want to beat the Saints, you bottle up 
Alvin Kamara, and you force a receiving core that's missing Michael Thomas right now. Yeah, they might get Smith back, but this is still not anywhere close to the best receiving core that they've had in New Orleans. You force Jameis Winston to win this game because I still feel like Seattle's probably thinking, especially with Quandre Diggs back there at free safety, the one consistent playmaker they've had this year. If Jameis Winston's put in a spot where he has to sling it all over the place all night long, he still has the propensity to try to throw balls into double and triple coverage. That has not been completely eliminated. Quandre Diggs can feast on that if he's throwing down the seam or on post routes. And so I think it, you can have a domino effect that really gets this defense going, but it all starts with stopping Kamara. And if you can't do that, the Saints could be able to do whatever they want on offense. And again, a game that should be close could get pretty darn ugly yeah. in a hurry. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so as we turn the page here to take a look at our predictions for this one, we'll go quick. Uh, the New Orleans Saints favored on the road, minus five in this one. Usually you give the home team three points. So really it's kind of like an eight point sort of uh, lift for the New Orleans Saints here, which is kind of wild. But when you look at this for the Seattle Seahawks, this Monday night game, what's your prediction for this one? Everything that I'm thinking about right now suggests there's no way the Seahawks are winning this game with the Saints coming off a bye. The fact that they're playing without Russell Wilson, they don't have Chris Carson. The defense still gave up 23 points to the Pittsburgh Steelers, who are not an offensive juggernaut. I mean, there's a million reasons to not pick the Seahawks to win this game, which is why I'm going to pick them to win. And yeah, <laughs> here's why I think the Seahawks are going to win 23 to 20. I think it's going to be very close. I think that that run game is going to be the difference in this matchup. Maybe this is the unleashed Rashad Penny game and he finds success. He's the type of back that might give the Saints some issues because he has that third and fourth gear when he gets into open field. That's something none of Seattle's backs otherwise have. So he's a different look in that backfield. I just think the Seahawks are going to have just enough running. I think Geno Smith's going to take care of the football. Not going to have gaudy stats by any means, but that's okay. You're running the football. You're sustaining drives. They win that time of possession battle, and I think they can bait Jameis Winston for a pick or two in this game. It's going to be close. I think it's going to be a lot like the game on Sunday against the Steelers, but this time around, Geno Smith's going to find a way to finish it. Jason Myers with a field goal inside five seconds left to play, and Seattle escapes the win. And now I'm completely regretting making that pick. But <laughs> <laughs> but hey, you know what? We take risks in life. I'm, I'm not <laughs> mad at you. I'm not mad at you at all. Uh, I actually have the exact same score, 23 to 20, interestingly enough, but I have the Saints taking this one, uh, which should probably be of no surprise to anyone. But the, <laughs> you know what I mean? But the, uh, the, the fact of the matter is that the Saints have been better on the road than they've been at home for the past probably three years. Sean Payton is one of the best coaches off of the bye week, uh, particularly in the last 10 years or so. And look, I, I've, I've had folks come in every week and say, yeah, well, you know, Jameis Winston's good for a pick or two and haven't seen it. You know, Jameis Winston right now, 1% less than his career turnover worthy uh passes so far throughout this season and he's up in a career high so far when it comes to his big throw percentage so he's looking pretty good and maybe i just jinxed it i don't know but at this point i, I don't have any reason to say that yeah Jameis winston has a propensity to cost the saints a game when he's throwing 30 times a game at most right so we'll see exactly how it all how it all pans out. But as of right now, I'm going to take the Saints to win this one, 23 to 20 on the road against Seattle. 12 Saints fans, as always, thanks for making our Locked On crossover special here, Locked On Seahawks, Locked On Saints, your first listen. Make sure to check out the Williamson and Peacock podcast for your second listen. Brian Peacock, Matt Williamson, they do an outstanding job covering the NFL five days a week. You can find that on any place you can find podcasts. Free download. Make sure to check it out. I'm Corbin Smith for Locked On Seahawks. You can follow me at Corbin Smith NFL on Twitter. Ross, where can people find your work? Hey, you can always check me out at Ross Jackson Nola on Twitter. And of course, every Monday through Friday over at Locked On Saints. It was a fun one, Corbin. Looking forward to this primetime Monday night matchup.